Um, there are four distinct parts when I'm thinking about designing lessons. And they're in a sort of an order. So it is a question of first things first, really, because there is little point doing uh, work on starters and plenaries if you haven't got a firm understanding of structuring learning. So we go from left to right. We go from here, the structuring learning, and we follow the road. I've, I've put them on a road and we start at the top on the left. OK, so once you've got a, 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 a concept of structuring learning, it's also important to understand about the different teaching models. Now, you've already had some input on both of these things from other people, haven't you? Is that a yes? Or a no? Or I don't know. Just show me. Have you had input on how to structure learning? One person thinks they have. OK. Um, have you had input on different teaching models? Different, you, your, your lecturers might call them different teaching approaches. Um, when I was, yeah, when, thank you. That's, that's really useful when you, when you give me a sign. Um, have you had any input on supporting the full range of pupils, for example, lower ability students? You've had some, okay, excellent. Um, so then as, as part of the, the thinking about structuring lessons, um, um, I would then include the beginnings and ends of lessons in that um, category, okay? Because it belongs with it. Now, within the lesson itself, there are certain skills, I will call them here, that the teacher needs to be actually using in the lesson. And I'm calling that the teaching repertoire. And, and the key things here, are modeling and questioning and explaining, setting up guided learning, pair work and group work, and then the whole range of active engagement techniques and motivation. So again, if, if we just go back to what I said earlier about focus, if you're, um, <clears throat> it's helpful to not be working at, on everything at the same time. It's helpful to be working on the thing that is most, going to make the biggest difference. So for example, um, it may well be um, the, you may well need to be focusing on the, the beginnings and the ends of your lesson, which is all to do with structuring the learning, lesson objectives, learning outcomes. You may be wanting to um, develop assessment for learning and so on and so forth, but don't focus on too many things at once. Try to keep a focus on the focus. The third thing, the third category I use when thinking, thinking about the, the knowledge, skills and understanding that you need as a teacher is um, what I'm calling creating effective learners. Now, this area is all about um, all the techniques and skills you need to um, develop independent learners. And you'll see that assessment for learning, which is the first of the purple circles, um, is the first step on that journey. Um, which is why I'm focusing on it, because many of you have, when I was reading your reflections in the Google Drive, quite a few people were, were, were expressed a desire to um, have their students develop independent learning skills. Um, so it's, it's a key thing. Um, in the English language teaching classroom, of course, there's developing reading and writing and all the techniques that accompany that. There's developing listening and speaking. And then there's developing the skills you need to think, developing thinking skills and learning skills. 
The final category that I think that I have chosen is creating conditions for learning. Now, this area of work is about the whole classroom environment and the management of learning. Um, so it includes work on how do I improve the atmosphere? How do I improve the atmosphere in the classroom, the climate for learning? It also includes work on learning styles. I think you've already touched on this with multiple intelligences and with VAK, visual auditory kinesthetic learning styles. I think you have. Um, this is about how as, I, how as a teacher do I actively tap into this information and knowledge in order to boost the student's ability to learn. It's about deliberate use of learning styles and multiple intelligences to structure the learning. And lastly, of course, but this doesn't mean it's not important, some people would put it right at the beginning of the journey, is managing behavior. Now, very briefly, when it comes to managing behavior, this is super important, of course, because nobody's learning in a classroom where the behavior is poor. However, The best way, and this is very shorthand, but the best way to manage a behavior is through structuring the learning in a way which is accessible to all, which is enjoyable to all, and where the students can see the importance of what they're doing. Because if a student understands the importance of what they're doing and, and the, the learning objectives and intentions are clear to the student, this has a very big positive impact on motivation and on engagement. The reason a lot of students misbehave is because they really can't see the point of what they're doing. They don't, under, they, they don't see why it's important and they're not getting anything out of it. They're not succeeding, they're not enjoying it. So these are the things which underpin poor behavior not some fault in their character. It, 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 the, it, it's the, the teaching is the key to managing behavior. Okay, I'm just gonna pause at this point because that was quite a lot of talking. And I'm just gonna give you time to familiarize yourself with the categories, with the different elements and time to take any questions at this point. If you want to ask a question, please um, just raise your hand and we'll take it from there. I don't know your names and your names are not on the screen. So Aisha, maybe you can help bringing people into the, into the conversation here, yeah? All right, sure. Okay, let me... So uh, you could raise your virtual hands or in case you want to write in the comments, but it's better to use just your mics and speak directly. Um, then again, maybe they need, uh, let's say a couple of minutes, maybe two minutes to digest what they've- Absolutely, there's no rush. Uh, yeah, so take a couple of minutes to think. <laughs> Of course, in a training situation, I would be saying, okay, now I want you to talk to a partner to work in twos on this. And I want you to tell each other which of these areas are the biggest priority for you. And secondly, I want you to make a list of three key questions that you would like to ask. And I would get you working in pairs here, which would activate your thinking a lot better than sitting up, sitting wherever you're sitting on your own. But basically that's what I would do. I would, so what I'm asking you to do on your own is to think about 
which of these areas of these 20, um, not 20, are there? Uh, which, which of these areas are the most uh, important focus for you? If you had to choose one, which one would it be? And the second question I would ask is, if you had three, if you only were allowed three questions to ask about all of this, what would those three questions be? So if I give you, say, two to three minutes to think about those things, then I'll take some feedback, okay? Thank you. I'm just going to stop the screen share for a moment. I can see 12 of you now, that's good. Okay, so have we got anybody brave enough to give me some feedback here about what the focus would be for you, firstly, and three key questions about the, the whole categorization of the teaching journey or indeed you might think that there's something missing in which case do say so if you want to contribute just unmute, unmute and fire away Uh, sir? Yeah. Um, hello. So surely all of them are important. Yeah. But uh, for me, active engagement techniques are one of the most important things in the classroom. Because if you, uh, if you engage most of the, the learners, there will be a fruitful discussions and the, the classroom will be active and uh, and light and uh, and the uh, life, like you bring life to the classroom instead of the uh, the um, the silence and the uh, um, I missed the word. Yeah, so uh, active engagement techniques is more important to me. Okay, do you have three any questions? Uh, actually, I don't. Okay, so that, that was Swad, was it? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Swad. You're welcome. Uh, Usama. So, uh, hello, sir. Uh, I guess uh, the creating conditions for learning is by far the most important criteria for me. 
because if the environment is good, uh, I guess that's what matters the most. Like all what we need is a good atmosphere where the learning should take place. Uh -huh. can, I, can I push you on this then, Osama? And can I ask um, what factors are important in creating that atmosphere that you're talking about? Yeah, so I guess, uh, first of all, we need to know each other, like the students and the teacher as well, so that we are like as a family in class, so that the students will feel in a safe environment to, for example, participate and talk. So I guess that's very important. Anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah, I have just uh, one question. Like this journey, is it going to change with time? For example, can we switch the, uh, the road? Do you mean, does it have to follow that order? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't have to follow that order, definitely not. Okay. Um, you can you can focus on any anything at any time. All right. Yeah. It is definitely like all learning. It is not linear. Uh, the 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 metaphor of a road makes it sound like it's linear. Yes. But um, the you, like with any journey, the first time you make a journey, you don't notice everything. Mm -hmm. The second time you make a journey, you'll notice something else. You notice something differently. I sometimes have been on the same road 10 times and it's a different experience each time. So exactly. learning, learning is not linear. It is, it is, it is cyclical. But it does, but it, but it does move. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it moves like that. All right. Yeah. It doesn't go like that. Yeah? Yeah, thank you, sir. Okay, I'm, I'm going to feed back on your feedback in a moment, but um, I'm inviting more participants, mm -hmm. please. It's giving me a good idea of where you're at, what you're thinking. <clears throat> Either people are very shy or it's still too early. I think uh, I don't want to say something. You don't. Uh, hello? Yeah. Ida is raising her hand, was raising her hand. I'm not sure. Who's that, sorry? Ida. Ida. Okay, far away, Ida. The floor's yours. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, th thank you. Hello? So Hi. I have uh, a question. Okay, um, I'm gonna start with the, the most AI I'm interested in. So developing uh, speaking and listening is, uh, I think it's the most important uh, because uh, for example, there are students that have uh, a great academic notes, but, uh, but when it comes to a, a crucial situation, they can't even uh, form a, a simple sentence, so it's it's like a, it's it's not for use. Okay, and uh, I have uh, only one question about uh, when uh, you told us about uh, manage uh, about uh, that uh, our uh, the objectives of learning have to be told to the students. Uh, how can we how can we make students aware of that of those uh, objectives Bec because uh, for example when you told them that learning in language will help them uh, finding uh, jobs in the future um, students don't uh, really are aware of the uh, of this important point because they are not in the situation of um, searching for a job. If you get what I mean. Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to jump in at this point? Yeah, Rami. Hello, sir. Hello, Rami. Hello, I think uh, 
creating a good uh, learning environment is very important where there is active listening and feedback because if the students miss only one part of a lesson at any lesson they might uh, lose motivation to to participate uh, in the actively listen in the next sessions and that's going to impact their learning very much yeah, that's a really good point, Rami. Uh, you're, you're talking about engaging the students in the process of their own learning by um, listening to, by as a teacher, listening to where they're at and whether they're understood. You're quite right that as soon as a child or a student loses the thread, I sometimes yeah. call it a thread, as soon as they lose the thread, they, it's very difficult for them to pick it up again. Exactly. And this is what leads to disengagement. So, so the whole point of assessment for learning and sharing learning objectives and outcomes and success criteria with, with the students is to engage them in the whole process of taking responsibility for their own learning. And that involves as well um, being, being clear with you know, giving you the feedback you need as a teacher if they don't understand something or you know, the confidence to ask questions. Yeah. Good, thank you for that. Uh, it's Khalid, sorry, your surname came up first. Um, is there any other questions you've got? Um, just how to make students uh, engage. Yeah. Not, not, not engage, but uh, have the confidence, as you said, to stop the teacher and tell him, uh, I don't understand this point. Because I noticed while I was learning, uh, many teachers always try to ask this question, uh, please stop me if you don't understand something, but we just don't, we can't. Well, well, why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? It's because in my experience, uh, it's a mixture between I don't want to bother the teacher and I don't want to be looked like the only one who does not <laughs> Exactly. So, yeah. I, you, you know, basically you're, 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 if, you, if you say to the, to the students, Tell me if you don't understand, you're saying uh, in, you're like, there's very, very few students are going to do that. Yeah. Because basically you're advertising to the whole class that you don't get it. Hey, I'm a bit stupid, you know? So obviously, obviously that's not going to work. So that's where the techniques come in. So the techniques for getting feedback, um, if, you, if you remember what we did last time, it was about techniques for... Um, finding out what your students have understood and these are techniques which do not involve them putting up their hand and exposing themselves to the whole class and going I'm a bit I don't get it and I mean the easiest one is of course the um, the traffic light system where they have a green and a red symbol on their desk which they can flip um, and, and then it's up to the teacher to notice that's just one example isn't it yes um, but don't expect a student to put their hand up and say, I don't understand. Don't expect that. That's ridiculous. Most students are not going to do that. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution, Khalid. I can just take one more if anybody has either burning questions or um, an interesting point they want to make. Sir? Yes, Sam. Yes. Uh, I, I was just wanna, wanted to point out at this structure that we followed. And my point from the beginning was the fact that I don't believe that it should be followed step by step because from my personal experience, I feel like the assessment for learning is the, the backbone of the whole learning structure. Because if we're able to uh, push our students to be self-aware of their own learning and helping them gain the ability to assess themselves and the peer assessment. And as you just said, they wouldn't raise their hand to ask. So if you're, it's 100% more chances for it to ask your own colleague because you are on the same level. And I'll explain this to you, you explain this to me. So if I am able or we're able as teachers to help them gain or acquire that ability, 
I think that what makes the difference between a good classroom, because I've read that it's not about the school, it's about the classroom, the quality Correct. of the teacher. Yeah. And that's about it. Isam, that is an incredibly important point. Do you have a question? Um, just if, if, I'm, if I've comprehended it correctly, the fact that the assessment for learning should, at least if we can shamble these points, it should always be in the back, the back of our head. It should always be the, the main point that we need to at least achieve, no matter what we neglect. That wasn't a question. <laughs> it was, it was. I'm, I'm wondering if that's actually a proper way of following it, or is it something <laughs> that should take priority to it? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, any other interventions before I come back on those very useful bits of feedback from you? Any others? Yeah, Shimai. Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering if it is okay if I can tackle um, three skills, reading and then speaking and then writing at the same time. For example, um, I tend to um, use writing uh, at the end of the session, um, almost each session as a, as a way of production as a way of the last step of the PVP. So is it okay if I use that like each session or is it gonna be like boring? Because this is one of the ways that I can ensure that they understand something. Mm. Um, great question. Great question. I'm gonna take these questions. I'm gonna try feedback on your questions now. And then if you have another question that you want to jump in on, I'm sorry if I'm not looking at the screen properly because I've got two, three screens going here. So don't be disturbed by where I'm looking. I can see you. Um, yeah. But if you do have any thoughts or questions that you want to bring up, please, please, please make a note. There will be other opportunities to do that. I'm going to take these in reverse order now. I'm going to start with um, Shimei's point about can I take three skills at the same time. Um, in every learning uh, episode, any, every lesson, um, you should be aiming to um, uh, develop and give opportunities for students to develop all four skills, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So there needs to be all four things need to be worked on at the same time in every lesson. This is ideally, it isn't always gonna be the case. You might be focusing just on speaking, but it's always good to think, um, if, if you're accessing learning via just one thing, it's not as effective as accessing the learning via different media. So having some listening is important. Having the opportunity to speak is incredibly important. Having the opp opportunity to see the language in print of some description on a screen or on a piece of paper, that is also gonna be important for some learners. And having the opportunity to write is going to be important too. However, there is no one thing that is going to work for every student in your lesson. So having a mix of things which are tied together and where the progression is clear is important. Um, your point about the writing. Uh, I don't actually agree with you that writing is, uh, is necessarily the way that it will fix the learning in the student's mind. For some students, writing writing it down is going to be very is going to be very important. Just if you could just make sure you're muted. Thanks. Um, for, for some, I'm getting feedback. Somebody's got their mic on. Um, for some students, the um, it's incredibly important to 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 be able to write nearly everything down, and that's how they learn. Um, for another student, they will learn by saying it over and over and over in their head and not writing it down. Um, as a teacher, we quite often feel more secure when we have a written outcome. It makes us feel secure, but it doesn't necessarily help the learner. Um, so be careful 
um, about presuming that that is the only way to fix the learning. I think that's what you're talking about. I think you're talking about fixing the learning. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, a visual, uh, an auditory learner. So it works really well for me if I can hear it and see it at the same time. And if when I'm listening to things, I'm often making notes. That works for me, but it isn't going to work for all the students in your classroom. Um, yeah, so you should be tackling more than one skill in every learning opportunity, in every learning lesson. Although during a lesson, you might be focusing on a different skill at a different time in the lesson. Okay. A lesson's got episodes. It's episodic. It's not, it's not just one thing. Um, okay. But the important point I think you're making, Shimei, excuse me. Just need to plug the power in. I don't know how I forgot to do that. Important, I think the important point you're making is to have specific measurable outcome. Um, now, a lot of teachers rely too heavily on a written outcome because that's what they're used to. That's perhaps how they've been taught as well. And the presumption or the assumption is that if I have a written outcome, I can measure what the students know and what they have learned. But this isn't necessarily the case. Um, there are many different ways of measuring progress, measuring impact, and writing is just one of them. The reason we use it a lot is because it's the easiest. That's why we do it. Uh, it isn't the best. Definitely not, and especially not for the English language learner. Because somebody, uh, an earlier person said, how do I, uh, Ida said, that her, 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 her focus was to develop speaking and listening because students have academic knowledge, they can write it down, but they can't even put a sentence together to communicate. So this all comes back to uh, being really clear about what it will sound like, what it will look like if the student has met the learning objective. So please don't fall into the trap of always wanting a written outcome. That is probably not the best way. It certainly isn't the best way for, uh, obviously for a speaking objective. How is a written outcome gonna be anywhere near relevant? It's just going to take up time and give people the illusion of progress. But it's an illusion. Uh, now then, uh, Issam, I think it was, who was talking about, he asked me the question, is AFL the backbone to everything? He was appreciating the fact that, you know, teaching is complex and there's lots of other things to focus on. My answer to that is absolutely yes, without any shadow of a doubt. Um, everything in the teaching journey can be linked to assessment for learning. In fact, if you focus on starters and plenaries, but you, do, but you are not um, skilled in formative assessment and assessment for learning, you're probably wasting your time. If you're focusing on managing behavior and learning styles, but you're not clear about the lesson objectives, the success criteria, and the steps of progress that the students are making, you're wasting your time. The assessment for learning underpins everything. It underpins your planning. It underpins the selection of activities. It underpins your decision-making processes for your every stage of the lesson. It underpins your understanding of the students whether or not you, uh, it, under, it underpins creating a safe environment in the classroom where everybody is listened to, not necessarily by the teacher, by each other, for example. It underpins 
the, uh, the climate for learning where it is okay to make mistakes because actually we all make mistakes and, we, and mistakes are super important because that's how we learn. Mistakes are great. If you got it perfect first time, it's my fault. I didn't make it difficult enough. I'm sorry. It's supposed to be difficult, otherwise you're not making progress. So assessment for learning underpins everything. Absolutely everything. To say it's the backbone is not an understatement. It is, uh, it's, it's, it's just non-negotiable, really. Thanks for that observation, Issam. Um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to also make the point that the whole one of the key benefits of uh, developing assessment for learning in the classroom is that you are activating the student as their own teacher, as well as activating students as a learning resource for and a learning and teaching resource for each other. That's what you're doing. Um, every time you develop assessment for learning in your classroom, you're, you're, <clears throat> excuse me, you're activating the students as a learning resource for themselves and for each other. So you are multiplying the number of teachers in the room. And the actual teacher is moving more into a facilitating and a design, a designer role. You're, you're, you're a facilitator and a designer of learning experience. You're a crafter. You craft the learning experiences, but you're not the, you're not the, you're not a lecturer. You're not a university lecturer. Uh, creating active listening and feedback is the key, was a point somebody made. Uh, absolutely correct. And um, engineering, I sometimes use the word engineering or crafting. I don't know if those words make sense to you, but um, engineering or creating experiences in which feedback is a key part of the activity is very important. So it should be, it should be um, not at the back of your thinking, Isam. It needs to be front and centre. It needs to be there all the time. The question needs to be, how does the learner know what they need to do? How have I made it easy, uh, possible, for the learner to know exactly what they need to do and why they need to do it and why it's important, okay? Or to put it another way, where am I now? Where do I need to be? How do I get there? What's my next step? That links into the point that, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't take a note of the name, um, that a young lady made about how do we make students aware of the objectives? Uh, you know, for example, we, you know, if we say to them, oh, it's really important, it's really important because you need it for a job. Of course, that's not gonna work. If you tell me when I'm, even when I'm 16, you say, you're gonna need this for a job, I'm gonna go, yeah, whatever, because that's too far away. Um, the, when I say the student needs to understand why it's important, I'm talking about the actual lesson. Um, and in my experience, focusing on longer term goals and targets is not very effective, especially not with younger learning, younger learners, it's a complete waste of time. This doesn't mean that it's not useful for a learner to see what their learning journey is. Um, I can show you an example of, 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 of what some schools have done to give the children a map of, 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 of the year. So they can at least see where the learning for that year is going. But a year is a long time if you're a young person. So the point about assessment for learning is, is, giving, is giving the learners 
a, a route map. So this is what we're doing. This is why it's important. This will enable you to do this, or this will enable you to understand this. This is why this is important. Do you see? So, so, so when, when we're talking about making the learning important, we're not talking about you need this because you're going to be using this in the world of work. You probably aren't. That's completely bogus. To say. It's just not honest to say that. I mean, what about what you're going to do with the child who turns around and says, yeah, but I, you know, there's no jobs anyway. What are you going to say to them? So it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a good way to motivate children. The way to motivate a learner is to give them a feeling of success. The way to, the way to, 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 to convince the learner that the learning is important and therefore they should engage, the way to do that is to give them a feeling of success. And in order for, in order for the learner to, to have a feeling of, of success, they need to succeed. So you need to engineer the lesson so that they see the point of the lesson, they see, and, and, and they, they, they understand that when they come into your lesson, they're going to be clear about what the learning, why the learning it, where it fits in into the, into the, the learning journey of becoming fluent in English. And then in the lesson itself, there are opportunities for the student to, to measure their own and each other's progress. That's what self and peer assessment is all about. But they cannot do any of that if the objectives and outcomes and success criteria are not clear. So that's why we start with that. Am I making sense? Are you, are you, are you following what are you, do you agree even? <laughs> do you even agree? Yes, of course. Uh, but uh, I have one question. What okay. about the student that comes to, uh, to the class, but the intention not to, it's not the, to become fluent in English. They are there just because their parents force them to come to the class. Okay. So, uh, every child in every mm -hmm. lesson, in every school in the world is there because they have to be, usually. And if you gave them a free choice, they probably wouldn't be, okay? So as a teacher, we have to make the experience of being in the lesson something that, a place that they want to be. I mean, yes, we all know they have to be there. Of course they do. But that's not the point. The point is that if the learning environment is stimulating, interesting, enjoyable and if they can see that it's useful because they are they are aware that they are learning and growing then they will look forward to your lesson even if their mummy and daddy says you have to go of course they might not want to go you probably didn't want to come today maybe i don't know you might have thought at seven o'clock this morning oh i really need a rest but i <laughs> but, but presumably you came because you thought you were going to learn something and, and you're motivated by learning something. Most human beings are motivated by learning things, by making progress, by, by, by growing. It's, it's a natural human instinct to want to be better. But if, if you, this is why you have to give children, uh, sorry, students, learners, adults, you have to create opportunities for them to be aware of what it is that they've learned. And you've got to say, listen, if you trust me and if you, if you do what I'm asking you to do, I will guarantee that in 60 minutes, you will be able to do this and this. And the, and the learner's like, oh, okay. I can't do that at the moment. Are you sure? And you say, yeah. Yeah, at the moment you can't do this. Well, if you if you if you go through if you if you if you join in if you engage with what it is I have 
uh, designed for you, and the experiences that I've designed for you. If you engage in all of this, then I, and if you engage with, with, with 100% commitment, then I guarantee that you'll be able to do this at the end of the lesson. You couldn't do it at the beginning. That's the level of detail that you need to be working with. And if you cannot do that, then I would forgive somebody for not being motivated. Why should I be motivated if it's not going to make any difference to me? Why? So you have to, you have to make a difference. Your lesson has got to make a difference. There's going to be a reason for me to be there. And if as, a, if as a learner, every time I come to your lesson, just imagine, every time I come to your lesson, I, I expect to make progress. Because last time I came to your lesson, I made progress. You made sure of that. You made it possible for me to succeed because of the skill with which you designed my learning journey. You understood what it was I needed. You understood what my difficulties were. You helped me to overcome those difficulties and the barriers. And you, and you, and you gave me access to learning activities and resources that helped me to make progress. And you gave me the opportunity to see that I had made progress and to prove and demonstrate that I could do something new, better, different than I could when I came into the lesson. That's what gives the student motivation. And of course, people say, oh, it has to be fun. Well, yeah, if it's enjoyable as well and fun, that's great. But let's define fun. I mean, I, let's, let's just not call it fun. Let's call it enjoyment. And enjoyment is very closely linked to achievement. Enjoyment comes from achievement and achievement comes from enjoyment. You can't separate them out. You enjoy and achieve, you achieve and enjoy. You make progress, you enjoy it. Okay, so going sure. right, sorry, in a moment, in a moment. The last thing is about creating conditions for learning, knowing each other, a safe environment and active engagement. I think, <clears throat> I hope that you, you can see that with assessment for learning and clarity about the learning objectives, opportunities for peer and self-assessment, high quality feedback. I hope you can see how all of those create conditions for learning based on knowing each other in a safe environment. I shall pause there to take any feedback or questions. <clears throat> Um, we have a hand up from GH4ZZ. Do you have a name, GH4ZZ? Yusuf, Yusuf, I'm sorry. Um, my, my name is Yusuf. Yusuf, thank you, Yusuf. Yeah. So, um, concerning motivating our students, um, what's the best way to approach a student who is not interested in learning English and motivate him to do his best in that subject? Uh, how to, to help him create an intrinsic motivation towards English. It won't happen overnight. Yes, no, I know. Um, but what will help will be giving that child um, frequent experiences of success. So if the learner is switched off or demotivated. We don't know why, but they might have had some really bad experiences of learning. Um, our job as an educator is to create the conditions in which they can be successful. We need, right. to, we, we need to create the conditions where they can succeed. Now, sometimes with a... a, a I'm going to call this person a reluctant learner, okay? 
they don't want to be there that they're, 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 they're a prisoner in your lesson um, they, they they they're in a bad mood or they, they don't contribute they, they they just they're just not interested at some point I would want to have a conversation with that learner and and just talk to them in their own language about you know, what's going on here and how are they feeling and is there anything I can do to help and what is it that you're finding difficult? I've noticed that you, da, 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 da. can you tell me why this is or can you talk to me about this? Yeah, uh, you, you need to get to, if there's one or two, if there's so anybody in particular who's particularly struggling, you, you need to give that person some time. You need to, you need to be there that not their friend, you're not their friend, you're their teacher, but you need to be their ally. They need to know that you're on their side. They need to know that you're not like that teacher who made their life difficult in the past. You're not the person who made them feel bad about learning. You're the person who's going to make them feel good about learning. But in order to do that, you have to win their trust. And in order to win their trust, you need to spend some time with them. You, and you need to find a way to listen to them. So you need to ask, but you need to listen. You need to not say very much. You need to listen. You need to work out how you can help them. And then you need to say, well, listen, come on, help me out here. What sort of things will help you to learn here? Give them some examples and maybe then even change what you're doing a little bit. Or if they say, listen, you know, I don't like it when blah, blah, blah. You, you, you can't meet everybody's needs. But if a, if a learner feels that you're listening to them, that's already a positive thing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Simon. Okay, well, if nobody's got some anything burning, that was really useful for me. Thank you. Um, the, the more you tell me, the, the better I start to understand. So we're going to do some input and we're going to do some practice now. Uh, yeah, Ida, did you want to say something? Yes, can I add something, please? Sure. Okay, thank you. So uh, I just want to give my opinion and please correct me if I am wrong. Okay, when I, when I am teaching students, I tend to focus on developing the uh, speaking and listening because uh, from what I notice, here in Morocco, the tourist guide, they are illiterate people, but they can speak English fluently. And not even in English, they can speak uh, many uh, multiple languages very uh, fluently. And even uh, uh, all generation, they are native speakers, but they, they have never been to school. So uh, I take them as an example. And uh, I can see they have never uh, read a book, or they can't even. Uh, uh, they have they have not even the ability to write a word, but they can speak uh, fluently. So, for uh, for my point of view, they are better than uh, those uh, uh, students with uh, with the great academic uh, wow. grade. Well, this is a really interesting point. And of course, I've met plenty of tourist guides in Morocco whose spoken English is better than the teachers I'm working with. And yes, you're quite right that they, they, are, um, they are functionally illiterate. They cannot read or write, but their pronunciation and fluency is 10 times better than the teacher <laughs> that, I'm, that, I'm, that I'm working with. <laughs> and they're a tourist guide with a pair of sandals and no education. <laughs> and obviously, they are tapping into um, two things, really. The first thing is that uh, formal education is, is <laughs> in many countries in the world, is a bit of a mess. Uh, but people, uh, human beings, uh, have an instinct to learn. We have an instinct to improve ourselves. It is a basic human instinct. Sometimes it gets knocked out of a person by bad experiences. Sometimes, you, you know, it's true. 
but it is a basic human instinct to want to make yourself better. I'm sorry, it is. I just believe that. You can disagree with me, that's fine. Um, and and the, the Taurus guide, uh, they, they have a, uh, a motivation, which is, is, is to make a living. And there's, there's a, you know, it, obviously that's going to um, stimulate their, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but human beings can learn without teachers. Um, and the whole point is that in a formal education system, we've sometimes grown up as students to believe that we can't learn anything without a teacher. It's complete nonsense. Uh, sometimes the teacher gets in the way of our learning. So um, it's a huge responsibility as teachers to make sure that we have experiences, that we set up experiences for our children, our students, our, our learners, which, which are going to help them to learn, not just because it's in the textbook. So to come back to your actual question about speaking and listening, yeah, um, for me, that's always been the emphasis um, has been, in a, as a language teacher, has been speaking and listening. But don't neglect the fact that the, um, the reason that the Taurus guide did not draw on the written word was not because he didn't want to, it wasn't available to him or her. Um, perhaps if it had been, they would have been even better. They would have had an even broader vocabulary. They could access information which would be useful, which would have been useful to them. And they're probably getting a long way by using improvisation, but they could possibly do an even better job if they could read. And they could probably be even more successful if they could write as well. So don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, as we say. Um, all these things can support learning. Yes, I totally agree. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we're going to do some... Um, um, We've been going for an hour and 20 minutes. Can I just suggest we do a five minute break and then I'm gonna launch into some pretty heavy learning. So go and do a little workout, get some fresh air, do 50 press ups and I'll see you at 10.27. Good. Hello again. Sorry, I cheated. Hey, sir. I took an extra two and a half minutes. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so um, are we all ready, yeah? Uh, I think so, yes. Well, there's some people maybe... Uh, if you can switch your video on, I know that you're physically in the room. <laughs> I mean, obviously you can switch it off and go and have a coffee, but you, you'll, you'll, miss, you'll miss what we're doing. But anyway, 
it's you're free to do what you want, I guess. <laughs> right, here we go. Are you ready? Yes. Excellent. I like the sound of that. So, um, you know, I was saying uh, what what you've been saying about students feeling safe, feeling heard. Well, the same applies to you. You know. This is what I wanted from, from the first session. I wanted you to, to get used to working with each other. I don't know what opportunities you've had to do that, but the reason we did the what we did was, was to at least have an agreement and for you to think about the way in which you work together. Um, I wanted you to, to construct a, a, a smart action plan. Some of you did. I wanted to see that, however, and a lot of people didn't share that with me, so I cannot judge the quality. Um, hopefully you, you started to, these are the session one, this is the first session. I wanted you to try three new techniques for finding out what your students had learned. Uh, I wanted you to be systematic about this um, and to record what happened and to come back and talk about it. And I wanted you to, to, to get into the habit of, to try anyway, gathering evidence of impact using one of the impact measuring um, processes which I gave you loads of ideas for and then I wanted you to start using formative assessment in your planning and teaching now then let's see how far we've got just to recap about your action plan the reason I wanted you to do the action plan are here um, somebody who hasn't done an action plan is not actually making their ideas concrete. They're not being focused. Uh, and we don't have anything that we can refer to if you don't have a plan, if you haven't written it down. You don't have to use that piece of paper, but why not? Why not use the piece of paper? Um, it's also important because it makes you accountable. If you're part of this group and we're all spending time trying to learn together, then you have an obligation to the group. You have an obligation to yourself, you have an obligation to me, and you have an obligation to the group. Otherwise, you're not part of the group. So the, the idea of having uh, making a decision to do something is so that you can then come back to the group and share with the group what you did and what happened. What was the impact? So I wanted you to use a planning template not for, this isn't about your lesson this is about your development as a teacher as a trainee teacher i wanted you to, to be specific about what exactly you were going to do what aspect of assessment for learning were you going to do listen if assessment for learning is the backbone of successful teaching why aren't you focusing on it and if you are fo focusing on it how do i know And if, you're, if, if, you, if you are focusing on it, and if you are trying new things, then how are you going to talk about it if you don't write it down? And how are, you, how are we going to learn from each other if you don't share what you've done? We aren't. So that's the point. So I had... I think I found three personal action plans out of a group of 16, 17, three. Uh, well, it's just not good enough because I don't know where I stand. Um, so that was an example we looked at last time about what you should be writing in your personal action plan. One thing that you're going to find relatively easy to change, write down what that is. And I'm not talking about... I'm talking about within the context of assessment for learning. I'm not talking about, um, I'm going to develop uh, speaking. That's not focused. That's not going to help anybody. It's not focused enough. So the idea of, 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 of the personal action plan is that you just make a commitment to focus on one thing or maybe two things. I'm going to, I'm going to introduce this and this. I've had a look at all the strategies, I've had a look at all the techniques, 
And these are the ones that I think are going to work with the learners in this particular class. I'm just going to try it out with one class. OK, that's the idea. Then you can come back to this group and, in the, and you can say what you did. And you can say it quickly and you'll be prepared. And we won't be, we won't be wasting time as you're like talking in a vague way. You need to be specific, precise, and we need to be able to learn from your experiences. We can't do that if they're not focused. These are, this is a recap of some of the techniques that uh, we looked at and, and Aisha looked at with you in the Thursday session. Um, the idea of sharing with students what it is you're looking for in, in, in a successful performance. We, amongst the suggestions that we made was writing objectives and sharing them or Another one is presenting completed work and saying, right, this is, this is the standard we're aiming for. Let's have a quick look at this. What, what are the features of this work? Because then you can specifically model what a good quality outcome looks like. We also had the reflection sheets, learning logs, triangle of learning as a way. Did, you know, I don't know if anybody used those because nobody wrote it on their action plan, their PAP. I don't know if anybody used those. And if they did use them, I don't know what the context was. I don't know why they used them. And I don't know what the impact was. So I don't know anything. You need to contribute to this group by being actively engaged. Some of you are complaining about your students not being engaged. You need to be engaged in this process and so that we can all learn from each other. And if you're not engaged with this process, then uh, then, you're, then you're not part of the group, I guess. I don't know. But certainly that's not the way I work. Uh, <clears throat> and here are the other, we had a look at exit tickets, find the firm, be the teacher, student summary, class basketball, three, two, one snippets. Now then, you have had time to read all these and to work out how they work and to pick something or maybe two things and go and practice them in your classroom. You've had time to do that. And I expect you to have done it. Otherwise, what's the point? What's the point of just turning up and listening to me going blah, blah, blah for three hours or whatever if you're not going to do anything? There's no point. You're not going to get better simply by listening. You're going to improve your practice by experimentation. And then you're going to improve your practice by experimentation, feedback from other people, and then re-experimenting. That's how you're going to grow and learn as teachers. And presumably, that's what you want to do. So for today, what I want to do in this second half of the session is to understand better how you can put it into practice. And I want us to be able to learn from each other by sharing experiences and insights. So this is going to be interesting. See if you are able to do this. We'll have a look in a moment. We're going to practice that in a minute. Secondly, I want you to start to think about using coaching questions so that when you are working with each other, you have a, a framework which you might use. Now, can, I just, can you just show me with, um, with a show of hands, can you just put your hand up if you have actually tried in the last two weeks specifically any new assessment for learning technique with your in your lessons just show me one person two people three people Okay. Uh, Professor, Professor Simon? Uh, you, sir. Yeah, I have to, something to say. Um, honestly, um, when we read uh, this stuff that you gave us about uh, PAP, Personal Action Plan, we tried to answer these questions, but honestly, I, find, I found the problem, which is when, I, when I'm inside the classroom, I just uh, improvise and act like I did before and forget about all of this stuff. I just do my stuff and try to do my way in explaining stuff to my students 
And I unconsciously forget about practicing this personal action plan uh, during my teaching process. I find this problem. Yeah. I used to uh, teach on my own, um, on my, with my own style and I just forget about applying these principle, principles during my teaching process. How, how can I remind myself while teaching with this stuff and implement them during my teaching process? Uh, thank you. That was a very honest um, bit of feedback. Thank you, Yusuf. I appreciate your honesty. Um, <clears throat> OK, well, step one, you have to believe that it's important. So it has to actually feel important, realistically important to you. It has to be important. It has to be a priority to you. So you need to consider whether or not it will bring benefit to your students to share learning objectives and outcomes in a more varied and clear way. If it isn't going to improve what you do, then of course you're not going to do it. If you think it isn't going to make any difference, then, then of course you're not going to do it. That's the first point. But the second point is, how will you know whether it's a good idea if you don't try? Um, the third point is, don't try to do it in all your lessons. Just pick one lesson, make a decision, make a decision. You're in control of your time. You're in control of your thinking. Make a decision which class you're going to do it with, on which day, and make, give it some thought. Think, why am I choosing this particular class? Now, my advice is choose a class which is easy. Do not choose a class which is already difficult. When you are trying something new, you need people who already are easy because you're trying something new. Don't try new things with difficult classes. That's just too scary. <laughs> That's ridiculous. So if you've got a class and they're already eating out of the palm of your hand, as we say, then try them because you, because they will be kind and they will, if they will try to, you know, they will try to um, collaborate with something new. But when you do something new, it's normally you don't do it very well. Normally, when you do something new, you do it quite badly. Okay. But you're never going to increase your teaching repertoire if you're not prepared to make mistakes. And of course, when you try a new technique, it quite often goes horribly wrong. <laughs> and you get it completely wrong, which is why you must do it with, a, with, 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 with friendly learners, people who like you. Don't do it with a difficult class. But when you are doing something new, Answer these questions. Number one, why am I doing this? Now, Yusef, the answer to that question is not, I am doing this because Simon says. That is not a good answer. Simon says, eat more chocolate. It's not necessarily what I say that's important. So you need to have a real reason for doing it. You need to think about it. The second thing is, why am I doing it with this class? And the third thing is, what do I hope to be the difference? What do I hope is going to be the difference? And the fourth question is, how will I know? What evidence, um, how am I going to get some evidence that what, what I set out to do has actually 
done what I thought it would do. And the fifth thing is to then, this is why you should only do it in one lesson, because afterwards you need to reflect. And you need to think, okay, so I set out to do this. You remember what you set out to do because you wrote it down. So you go back to your plan and you said, I made a decision to do this because I wanted this, this, and this. This is what I expected to happen. I then went and did it. This is what actually happened. I wonder what I need to do differently to make it better. Or do I just throw that idea in the bin and try something different? So you have to go through this process yourself. It's not something I can do for you. Nobody can do it for you. If you want to develop, you have to be the person, you have to take control, but you have to do it in a systematic way. Otherwise, you, you don't know what you're aiming for, you don't know why you're doing it, and you don't have any evidence that it's working. You need to have evidence that it's working. It's irresponsible to do something new in your classroom if you do not record the impact of doing something new. You might be doing something new, which is actually worse than what you're already doing. So you go backwards, you become less effective. You need, to, you need to be systematic. It's the responsibility you have as a professional learner to be systematic. Youssef, have I answered your question? Uh, yes, thank you so much. So uh, what I get from your point is that uh, I have to, it's a must that I should try this uh, personal action plan and try to implement it in my teaching philosophy. But, um, um, uh, my question is, um, it's, it's not a question, uh, like this personal action plan is not going to 100% work for, for me, it depends, but I have to try it anyways. If it works, that's fine. If it, if it didn't work, so I'll have to, to try something else that is suitable for, my, uh, for myself and my students, right? Well, the personal action plan is a piece of paper, that's all it is, and it's you can use whatever you want. You don't have to use that particular piece of paper, but the process is what's important. And the process is what I've just gone through with you just now. The process is, what am I gonna do differently? Why? In other words, what do I expect the, the, the positive benefit from it? What, what am I trying to do differently? Why am I doing it? What should happen if I'm successful? What technique am I gonna use? And what evidence am I going to gather? Where am I going to get the evidence that this is actually working? Now, if you don't do that, then you're not, you're, then you're not going to be developing. You're just going to be doing what you always do. But if you, if you don't want to implement anything new, then don't do it. If you don't want to do anything differently, then don't do it. This is only suitable for people who want to make changes. If you don't want to make changes, then for goodness sake, you know, give yourself a break and go and have a coffee. But this is about what you need to do if you, are, if you are wanting to develop your practice. You cannot develop your practice without trying new things. And without reflecting, it's impossible to develop your practice without reflecting. And you cannot reflect without writing things down or speaking about them. It is not possible. Well, it is possible, but it's, 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 it's not it's it, you cannot see the difference you cannot see the progress so effective reflection usually involves a conversation now sometimes that conversation might be in your own head sure but then a successful professional has a log they write stuff down or they speak stuff down they 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 self-monitor they have a professional portfolio or they have a diary or they have a learning log or they have something. They have something. They have a way of recording their reflections because your reflections get lost if you're not careful. And that's a real shame because they're worth, they're very valuable. Uh, Issam had a question. Uh, yes, sir. I think when I gave a look 
to the tools of evaluation, the ones we were going to use in the PAP, I kind of cheated because I found that we already used in our club or class the, the focus group, the right. Simpsons completion and the observation. Right. But what I found out when I actually focused on them, like I kept track, the session was more optimal because we were able to kind of look back at what we've done and we implemented the critical incident analysis, which I wow. honestly find that PAP is basically that. Yeah, it is. That we, instead of putting our emotion up front, me and my colleague just decided that we're going to be critical about each other. We're going to try to implement this idea and we're going to be able to improve each other. This yeah. is what I find that went well with what you've been doing. And this is what could have been done better. And it was vice versa. So I think yeah. it's yeah. kind of hard to implement at the first, especially if you're working with a colleague that you don't know. But luckily enough, I work with two colleagues that we're, we've been friends for a couple of years. So Fantastic. No, no matter what kind of critic I give them or they give me, I wouldn't take it personal. Excellent. So my, my question would be, if I'm working with someone that I is only a colleague, I only see in working hours, how would I know that he wouldn't or she wouldn't take my, crit, my positive uh, criticism as personal attacks? Hmm. Well, you need to... This happens over time. You build up a, a relationship of understanding and trust with another professional over time. Uh, it helps to have um, a discussion using the tools of effective collaboration. So um, the worksheet that I gave you last session is an example of something that you can use to um, um, just to have a conversation about what it is that we're doing, you know. So, for example, um, there isn't an easy answer to what you're saying, but you can, it is, it, 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 obviously trust is important and people, in order to give criticism, you have to be specific about the context and the purpose. So if you, yeah. And, and you build up that process over time. It's almost as if you need what I would call a coaching agreement. And I have worked with people like, like yourself. And before we do something like what you're just suggesting, you know, where you watch each other, a lesson observation, for example, or a conversation about before we do any of that, we sit down and we say, right, what is it we're trying to do here? What are the rules? What are the rules? And we, we, we have a conversation about uh, what I call a coaching contract. <clears throat> and we write it down. We make it really simple, but we write it down. It's right. Well, this is, this is what I want. Now, if you remember, uh, one of the... Um, Hang on a second. Right. This one, the peer lesson observation sheet. Yeah. This is an example of a preparation sheet. So I know it's a little bit formal, but if I'm working with you and I want you to come in my lesson, I, I want you to focus on what I want you to focus on. So we would have a conversation and I would say, uh, Isam, you're going to see a lot of things in my lesson. And you're going to have an opinion about a lot of things in my lesson. But I don't want you to talk about those. Because we're just going to, I just want you to focus on this thing. Now, this is very difficult to do because we love to share our opinions and we love to talk. And we think that what we have to say is important and we're not very good at listening. 
So, but when we're working with a colleague, it's really important to establish those ground rules. So the peer lesson observation sheet helps us to do that because you write down and you both do one. So if, I'm, if I was watching you, if I, if I was working with you, Sam, we would have the same piece of paper. You would have a copy and I would have a copy because this is an agreement about what I am going to do for you. And I'm not gonna go outside of that except with your permission. So if I do want to go outside of that, I would have to ask your permission and say, can I share something about blah, blah, blah. But do bear in mind that effective collaboration involves keeping the focus on the focus. Because if you talk about everything in a lesson, you probably won't be able to draw out the key points of learning, which will help you to develop. You might have an interesting conversation, but you'll come away from it and think, so, so what do I need to do? And if, you, if, 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 if you're working with a colleague and they mention 10 things, you can't work on 10 things at once. You just wanna work on one thing or maybe two. So having the, the lesson observation sheet helps you to be focused. And it also says exactly what evidence you're going to try and get. And, 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 and it's, it's a contract. It's a contract. It's, more, it's about what you will do, but it's also about what you won't do. Because if it's not on the sheet, you don't do it. Because if you do do it, you're losing the focus. And if you lose the focus, you lose the learning. And the point of what you're doing is to fix the learning. Keep the main thing the main thing. Now, if as a, as a result of doing this, a very important focus comes out, well, you then negotiate with each other and say, uh, but something really important has come out of this. This is obviously more of a priority. We should make that the focus for the next one. And that becomes the focus for the next one. Uh, all of this should happen within, uh, an, you, you need to have an understanding. So for example, we have, I, I have some ground rules for this. A very important one is this. What we discuss with each other is non-judgmental and it is private. We do not share it. I will not share it with anybody without your permission. It's all about permission. So you do not talk about it with other people. Because the moment you do that, you've broken the contract of confidentiality. I'm not saying that you cannot talk to other people about what you're doing. I'm saying you cannot talk to other people about your collaboration without the permission of each other. That's all. And, and, and you just build this, this, this trust like that. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, Issam. Yes, yes, sir. So it's just about a back and forth cooperation and trying to understand each other. And I'd say put a, yourself in the other person's shoes. Always. Maybe this will become clearer in a moment. Um, as part of today, I want you to at least practice writing some smart learning objectives at least practice. And I'm also gonna hope, I hope we'll get time to have a look at the basic three, four part lesson and the seven stage learning cycle, just as two other ways of looking at how a lesson shapes. And then I'm gonna present some more techniques for learning objectives and for, start, for what you do at the beginning and the end of lessons, okay? Now then, next time, if there is a next time, um, when you're working as a group, if you, are, if you are going to be systematically developing AFL, then what I would normally do, and I'm not gonna do this today because we haven't engaged, the whole group has not engaged in the process in a systematic way. 
But if you do engage in a systematic way, then there is the possibility that you have a, 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 a meeting as a group with Aisha, for example, and you try a, um, a, a new technique. And because you've used the lesson plan and because you've used the action plan, you've actually written down what you tried, what you learned, what went well, what was even better, just like Islam you said in, uh, just then. And then you report back to the group in a focused way for about three minutes, maybe two, three minutes, and everybody gets a turn to do this. So in that way, you all learn from each other because everybody's trying different things, but they're doing it in a focused way. And all the things they're trying is from a defined list and it's within the context of assessment for learning. So it's still focused. Okay, that's the point of that's the point of having a professional learning community, is that you learn from each other. It's like a classroom. You learn from each other, and the routine is that when you share your experiences and insights, the other group members make notes. They don't just sit there passively; they listen actively, and listening actively means that they write down at least one question that they would like to ask. Now, there isn't time for everybody to ask a question. So when you have your three minutes or maximum five minutes to feed back to the group about what it is you've done using your personal action plan as your, as your framework and your peer lesson observation sheet, these two key pieces of paper, if you don't like the piece of the paper, make your own. If you don't like these, just make your own. I don't mind. But when you are listening, then you should be aware of the things that we talked about on the effective collaboration. You should sign up to that. So again, it's good to have these in your head when you're working. So when you're asking a question, <clears throat> you need to be probing. <clears throat> the questions you're asking should be probing. And they should be demanding because it's... it's the purpose of what you're doing is to try to increase your, your understanding. It's, it's trying to deepen your professional understanding. And we're not going to do that by being nice. We're going to do that by being quite demanding and probing in our questioning. Challenging. You're going to learn by being challenged. You're not going to learn by me going, oh, bravo, well done. You've learned nothing. You've learned nothing. You might feel good, but you haven't learned anything. If I then say, um, tell me a little bit more about the reaction of the lower ability learner when you tried to engage them with the success criteria. If you answer that question, you're learning. But it might be uncomfortable because I'm asking a difficult question. OK, so learning involves discomfort. Growing as a professional involves discomfort. If you are comfortable, you are not learning. I don't think you are. If it feels easy, you're not learning. The third sheet that I've asked you to use and which I don't think anybody has used, but please forgive me if I'm wrong and correct me, is the reflective feedback. So that is another tool that you can use. There are three key tools that you can use. These are all in your folder. And I, I will upload I that. Excellent. I used that too. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, great. How many more people have used it? Yousef's used it. 
Osama's used it. Yes, yes, I saw yours actually, Osama, or I saw something that you had used and I was quite impressed, I have to say. Well done. Um, excellent, good. Right, well, that's, that's fantastic. That's, you know, some people are starting to, un, you know, starting to actually be systematic. That's really good. So have we got two volunteers just to model, show us what I would expect everybody to do in your next session when you come together? So I would like, if somebody is there who is willing to go through this process with me now, with the group now, and if somebody has actually done the reflective feedback sheet and has taken a focus and has um, tried out a new technique, we would love, I would love to hear from you and we'll, we'll give you three to five minutes to talk about your experiences in a structured way. Are we a I'll volunteer? Go. Who was yeah. that? Uh, me. Sorry, I can't see everybody. Who, what's your name? Isam. Hey, Isam. Okay, that's one person. Have we got another person? Isam and Aida. Excellent. Um, so, I, you, do you need some time to prepare? No. Excellent. Aida, do you need some time to prepare? Uh, no, but uh, uh, I am going to talk about uh, my experience with the personal uh, action plan. Is, is that okay for you? Yeah, that is okay for me. You... Okay. So, thank you. Um, Isam, um, would you like to start? No problem, of course. So before uh, going through the, the specific focus, the first step, the, um, the start of the lesson and in the middle of the lesson, just keep in mind that I tried peer assessment. Um, I used to shy down from peer assessment because I thought that the students would um, be too critical of each other. And it'll turn out into a competition instead of pushing each other to learn. But in the previous session, we tried this to, um, to see how it works and if it's as uh, productive as we thought it would be. So what worked well and why? Uh, we always usually start with an icebreaker because it puts the students at ease and it allows them to feel safe and kind of drop their guard down. And what would have been better or even better is if we were able to connect the icebreaker, the, the game we used in the icebreaker to the previous lessons, um, allowing, it, allowing for it to uh, be sort of a review and a fun thing to do. Uh, for the middle of the lesson, as I said, what worked well and why, it was the peer assessment. Uh, the students didn't pull back when it came to their, if we're going to call them punches to each other, everyone was pushing the other person to uh, learn more, trying to show that they uh, were able to capture what was the heart of the lesson. So one person would tell the other, their, either their peer or the person who just spoke, what the mistakes they've done, what should have been done, what they would do in their position. So we had more students sharing their opinion and their own experience, which was a very nice thing to see. Um, what would have been better? It's if the, the students were able to understand the importance of their opinion when it comes to uh, the improvement of one another, because they weren't, I, it's understandable. It's just trying to find fault in what went well because they weren't trying to push each other. They weren't trying to force their own ideas and ideals on each other. They would just say, in my own opinion, you might be um, accepting or uh, going against this idea of mine. Um, and for the end of the lesson, um, as reliable as synthesis is, because we've already seen it previously in uh, lesson planning and whatnot, it was the utility of it as an overview and it allowed us a feedback and to create a back and forth loop between us 
in our students. And what could have been better is if personally, I could manage time better to allow everyone to express themselves with more ease when, and without time pressure. I find that my colleagues are better when it comes to uh, time management. And that's that. You, you're muted, okay. Sir. <laughs> Thanks, Issam. Uh, I, I'm going to now play the role of somebody who is in the group, um, who has listened to what you have said, and who is going to ask challenging questions to try and dig a bit deeper. Okay? Please do. Um, you said um, in the first part of the lesson that you wanted, it would have been better if you'd connected the icebreaker to the previous learning. Um, can you uh, expand on that and tell me um, how you might have done that if you taught that lesson again? Well, when it comes to my class, it's kind of special because me and my colleagues were responsible for the discussion class. So our, our purpose is mainly to help the students to be able to just talk, to express themselves freely. And the previous lesson was about modern evolution. And the new lesson was about IT, uh, NAI. Okay, so, um, so sorry if I can just interrupt. Wow. Uh, if you can, um, so so my, my, I have a new question. How might you connect the lesson that you have just taught with the next lesson via an icebreaker? Of course, I'll I'll answer the first question, then I'll answer the second question. I now in retrospect. I think that I could have connected AI to uh, modern evolution because we see the utility of the new technologies that help us perceive easier the previous evolutions. But instead of doing that, we just skipped and talked about AI. Um, for the next discussion, we're going to talk about enumerate fasting and the importance of fasting. So now thinking about it, we're going to have it this afternoon. We're going to talk, first of all, about how we were able to keep track of people's health with BMI calculators, which is related to AI, and how we were able to keep track to the people who were fasting and how we could connect that to their macros, their weight gain, their protein gain, and everything related to their health. So that would, I think that would be a good jump from an easier jump from what we've seen last time to what we're going to see today. Thank, thank you, Issam. Um, we've used up our five minutes. I do have some more questions, but we don't have time for them. No problem. Okay, so that's an example of, um, very, many thanks, Issam, for that very focused, um, I, I liked, um, I found that useful uh, because I, uh, because Issam was, fairly focused about um, look he he explained to me what went what he tried in each phase of the lesson what went well and what would have been even better he explained that to me in a way that I could understand um, and so I was able then to ask questions to dig a little bit deeper so that I could deepen my own understanding and then maybe uh, use his experiences um, to change something I'm maybe going to do in the future. I have a really interesting question that I want to, uh, well, I have something that I'm interested in that I would want to dig deeper if I had more time with Isan, and I would want to explore more deeply uh, this problem. How, what do I need to do differently? Or what does, what do you, what does Isan need to do differently? in order to help the students to see the value of the peer assessment. Because if they can see the value of the peer assessment, then they will engage in it more deeply and it will become more embedded in the lesson. So that was a key question for me for the middle part of the lesson. 
for the end part of the lesson, um, I would want to push Esam and say, you, um, you talked about your colleagues being better at time management than you are. Could you give me three specific examples of what they do differently, which you might try yourself? So those are examples of, of a coaching debrief conversation that you might have. Any questions? Um, no, I think it's pretty obvious. Good. Um, the, the benefit of having the, um, the, the, the paperwork, if you like, I don't like paperwork, by the way, but the benefit of having the paperwork is that you have a record and it, it, it forces you to be more focused about what the focus is going to be. It helps you to focus on the focus. So I would presume that, Isam, you do, um, this is part of, of um, a process and that you now have information from the first part of the process to feed into the next part of the process so that the next time you do this, and I would expect people to do it at least once every two weeks, the next time you do this, um, you have a very clear focus as to what you're going to do differently and to what, you know, what evidence you're going to gather of that. So that's how you create a dynamic learning experience by the quality of the process. Um, Aida, the floor is yours for between three and five minutes. Okay, thank you, sir. Um... Well, I tried the, the role play uh, technique. So I used the, the book conversation as a role play. And uh, actually I was shocked about the low level of some students. And I asked myself, uh, how did I not notice that? How I, I didn't um, notice those students. The, when, that's, uh, that's where I realized I realized that, that uh, they weren't participating at all uh, during the class and they were always hiding behind the good students. So uh, next time I tried to focus more on those students and I tried to, to, uh, to, uh, to address my question, especially to them. And uh, another thing I want to talk about is that uh, my colleague uh, uh, made an, uh, a, good, uh, a good observation about uh, me when I was uh, giving a class. He said that I tend to use a lot of Arabic when explaining a lesson. And that's because that uh, when I am explaining a lesson, I, and when I finish, I can see the confusion on my student's face. And I ask them, did you understand? And, and they all answer me with, yes, we did. And uh, I, I told them, are you sure? And they say, yes, teacher, everything is clear. But I can still see this confusion on their face. So here, I, when I re-explain, explain the lesson in Arabic and here I can say my students say oh yeah now I understand oh yeah yeah now I see so I know that this is why I use Arabic but it was a good observation from my colleague uh, and I want to know what do you think um, professor about uh, this if you have any opinions to add thank you Thank you, Ida, for sharing. Um, I will just make, uh, I'd start off with one point here, which is within the teaching, teacher learning community or the professional learning community, which is what we're talking about here, this particular group. Um, what Ida has talked about there, what you're talking about there is not focused on assessment for learning, although it does, it does point to 
areas where you, in future, where you could focus. Um, you, I think you are talking about um, three things. First of all, that you were not aware of the lack of progress of some of your students. You were not aware. So that suggests a focus for your next observation. It suggests, and I would phrase it as a question, what might you do differently in order to get more information on a more regular basis about what your students know and understand and can do so that you are aware, you've identified a problem. So I would, I would, I would then encourage you to think about what are you gonna do differently to address this problem? And are there any of the techniques that we've discussed about assessment for learning, which you, which, which you think might help you to solve that problem? And if so, which ones? And if you decide which ones, when are you going to try them? So those would be my questions to you. And then secondly, you're talking about learning of a problem that you have with sharing learning intentions, learning objectives with the students. And the problem is that they're not telling you the truth. The problem is that you're explaining the learning objectives in English and then saying, do you understand? And they all go, yes, miss, even if they don't. Um, so I would turn that into a question. And my question would be, what do you need to do differently so that you can share the lesson objectives in English? And so that you, so that you know that they've understood them. What do you need to do? Because obviously what you're doing at the moment doesn't work. So you're sharing them in English and they don't understand it. So you're having to use Arabic. So my question to you would be, you need to, so what might you do differently so that you can share them in English in a meaningful way? And what do you need to do to check their understanding? What can you do? Those would be my questions. And then I would take those questions, put them in my head, look through all the resources that I give you, the techniques, and use the questions to decide which of those techniques you're going to use. Yes, of course, I will do that. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think um, Khalid was first. Yes, sir. Uh, I just have a question for you. I teach advanced English and uh, the majority of my students are already studying in the university. They're studying English. And uh, even the ones who aren't, they're very capable and they're more advanced than the class itself. So uh, I noticed that they have no difficulty whatsoever, uh, neither in communication, grammar, vocabulary, writing. They're just basically excellent. And you said earlier that if it's easy, then there is no learning. My question is, how do I make it hard? Because so far, uh, it just feels like uh, I'm just learning with my colleagues because they're, they're all excellent. That's a great question. 
Um, well, all I can say there is I would love to be able to experiment with you on this class. It sounds wonderful. Um, I would, if I was going to work with you on this class, I would have a conversation with you and I would say, okay, so what exactly do you want? What is, what's your problem? You know, what is it you want to improve? Um, describe the current situation to me. Okay, so what might we do differently here? We'd have a conversation about it. I'll step you through the process in a moment because I'm going to go through it with everybody, okay? Um, I'm not going to give you an answer, Khalid. You, most of you will begin to realize that I don't tend to give lots of answers. I tend to give lots of questions and point you in the direction of the answer. But I, th I think the part of the answer for you is to make that the focus of your next experiment is what do I need to do to make this more challenging so that these learners are actually being stretched? Now, that's not a question I can answer right now. And actually, if I did give you an answer, I'd just be giving you a fish. And what you need to do is you need to learn how to fish. Exactly, thank you. I'll. Uh... I will try to uh, use uh, advanced grammar lessons because uh, the ones in the book interchange are very basic, like uh, past continuous, past simple, past perfect, noun phrases, uh, gerund phrases as subjects. These things are very, they, they already learned this in the, yeah. their high school. So they're sure. pretty familiar with it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you, uh, based on an analysis of what they can do, um, Obviously, if you're sticking to the textbook, you're making a mistake. And that is always a mistake. The textbook is just one of very many different resources. And it's, if, you know, it's not necessarily at the right level, obviously not. It's just a textbook, for goodness sake. So, um, you, yes, you, 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 it sounds to me like you do need to work on identifying the level of challenge. But don't jump to conclusions. Spend some time thinking about what your options are. Just wait for a moment, Khalid, until I step you through the GROW model, which I'm going to do with the whole group, if you don't mind. Issam, over to you. You have the floor. So, uh, sir, I just want to share my experience with the peer listen observation. Uh, I can't hear you, sir. Um, Issam had his hand up. Issam. Uh, no? Oh, no, sir, no. No, it was Osama in there. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. okay, sorry. Okay, Os Osama, over to he, you. He just forgot it. Yeah, so uh, I said, uh, I just want to share my experience with the peer lesson observation sheet. So uh, we did uh, this, me and my colleague, uh, Isan, since we have uh, the same class, which is the discussion class. And uh, to be honest, uh, Isam did spot some areas that I was lacking during my class, and uh, it did work uh, very well. And I did spot some things too. So uh, my question is, how often should we use uh, the peer listen observation sheet? I mean, we use it for the last two weeks and uh, it was really beneficial. So I'm just wondering if we should keep like using it each session or just uh, once in a while. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Osama. Um, the point of the peer lesson observation sheet is not to spot problems. The point of the peer lesson observation sheet is to record the process of improvement. The process of improvement is never ending. There is no end to how much you can improve. So whenever you find something that is useful, you should find a way to make it habitual or routine. So whenever you find a way of working that is um, beneficial and boosts your skills, knowledge and understanding, for goodness sake, build it into a routine. Make it happen. Just make it happen. But the peer lesson observation sheet is a blank piece of paper 
the value of the peer lesson observation sheet is not the piece of paper, it's the process. Um, and the process will increase in value in relation to the degree of focus and challenge that you have, and that is your decision and your responsibility. So if you experiment uh, with different focuses, you should be clear about when you have finished a particular element and move on to the next one. Um, and the peer lesson observation sheet can be used for the rest of your life because it's a process. And it, in its simplest form, the process goes like this. Where am I now? Where do I want to be next? What do I need to do to get there? How will I know when I've got there? And I would add another question. Who or what will help me to get there? What do I need? And who can give me it? Or what can give me it? But if you follow those four, those are exactly the same steps that the, that the learner in your lesson needs to follow. They're the same for you, Osama. Yeah. They're the same. The process of assessment for learning is the same as the process for professional development. The tools that I'm giving you for professional development, if you think about them, are about self-assessment, peer assessment, feedback. They're the same. Yeah. Yeah. The, the process of professional development is the same as the process of learning in a formal lesson. The process is the same. Obviously, it feels and looks completely different, but the process is the same. The steps are the same. The cycle is the same one. And really important in all of this, not just for you, but for your students, is reflection, building in routine, routinely building in time for reflection. John Dewey, we learn nothing from experience. We only learn from reflecting upon experience. We learn from the conclusions we draw, from reflecting on the experiences we've had in all sorts of different contexts. That's where the learning takes place. Adult professional learning is no different to student learning. It's no different. We're just hopefully better at it because that's why we're successful. But we want to make our students just as successful as we are. In fact, we want to make our students more successful. I'm always proud when one of my students comes back to me at the age of 40 and they are a world-class journalist and they are self-motivated and they know how to learn what they don't know because of the way they have learned when they were at school. And that makes me really proud. I think I was part of that and I'm proud of that because that person is totally independent of me and that's great. That's what we're aiming to do. Uh, Musin, you have a question. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. So, uh, classes, uh, well, so one thing I try in my classes is um, I try to make use of um, of differentiation that is delivering the content in. Um, in different ways, like I make use of videos, uh, conversations, texts, and um, games, and so on. So, um, and another thing is that 
I try always to uh, reduce uh, teacher talking time. Um, and I have a question here. Is it really uh, useful to, uh, to reduce uh, teacher talking time? Because um, I mean, do uh, students really learn because it's more comfortable for teachers? And uh, for example, a teacher is the one that possesses knowledge and uh, when, when students, for example, work in groups, they, they are more likely to make mistakes and so on. So uh, a teacher is the one that uh, that has that knowledge that uh, speaks fluently. So is it really useful to, uh, to reduce uh, uh, teacher talking time? Another question I have is how to make it possible for students to to take their ownership in, in their learning process. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, interesting. So we have two questions there at the opposite ends of the, of the spectrum. One is the teacher possesses the knowledge. So why, why reduce teacher talking time? Uh, uh, the second, how do we make it possible for our students to be independent? Well, there's a big tension between those two things, isn't there? Um, what I would say is um, most people do not learn from listening to people. Most people learn by making sense of what they hear, making their own meaning. So when you are talking, that's obviously important. You are one of the models. A video is another model. Uh, a conversation is another model. A text is another model. A game is another way to present information. But what's important in all of this is the opportunities that the student has to make sense of it, to process it. And the student cannot do that when you are talking. So there needs to be both. And both needs to be purposeful. So I'd ask you a couple of questions and I don't want you to answer them. But question number one, I do, but not now. Question number one is, when you are talking, what is the purpose? The second question is, when you are not talking, why are you not talking? And you need to be able to answer those questions. There are other questions that, that, that suggest themselves from what you said. And here's one for your focus at some point. And it, and it could be this. When I have set the work for the students to do in groups, how do I know how do I guarantee that they are learning and that the quality is high? That's a great question to answer because you're saying that it might not be good. Well, if it isn't good, what do you need to do to make sure that it is good? And that then becomes a focus for your personal action plan, which is something you could work on for quite a long time. But then I would, if I was your tutor, I'd be saying, how do you know that you are focusing on the right thing? How do you know that you are focusing on the most important thing? You only have a certain amount of time. So how do you know that this is the one thing that will have the biggest impact? Prove it, where's your evidence? Okay, um, Musim. You're muted, yeah. Musi. <laughs> okay, so Mohsin and Yusuf, could you please use separate rooms? I told you you should not be in the same room because there will be echo when you speak. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're, sorry, uh, we're just going to use one mic from my computer. Uh, he's going to talk to my mic, okay? That's better. All right. Okay. 
Okay, Professor, thank you so much. Uh, it's really understandable, uh, but uh, I mean, how can can a teacher uh, like how can how can a teacher make uh, students uh, take their ownership? Because I think um, you know they students have to take ownership in their learning process. They have to to be able to uh, to uh, to make use of of uh, of uh, the content that, that the teacher delivers uh, in order to um, in order to uh, in order to learn. So uh, one thing that uh, that I really try is that you know I I said that I I try different ways in in the classroom. For example, I try uh, different methods, different ways of delivering the content, but. Uh, but the question: How can I know the students? Uh, like, how the students can uh, can learn uh, from uh, from my uh, from my teaching? And so, thank you, Musin. Um, <clears throat> the answer is assessment for learning. By in, by making assessment for learning the core of how you teach. And it takes a long time to establish effective assessment for learning in your class. It takes months, possibly longer, but you do it over time. The more you introduce clarity of lesson objectives, clarity of success criteria, routines that work for students to peer and self-assess, the more you work on developing effective feedback, the more work you do on your questioning techniques, the, the clearer you are about lesson structure, starters, plenaries, and outcomes of all activities, and the more opportunities you create to gather evidence of progress, the closer you will get to answering your question. Okay. Um, I, I want to move us through because we, we simply don't have enough time. Um, but, I, but I think if I can just draw together a couple of things there, um, it would be that you need to trust me when I say that working on assessment for learning in a systematic way and developing routines in feedback, questioning, peer assessment and self-assessment, it will work. I, I'm not saying that just because it's my opinion. Read the work of, of Professor Dylan William, of Professor Paul, Paul Black, uh, uh, of Shirley Clark, of uh, th there's lots of evidence out there that these are the things that make the biggest difference. They're not exclusive, but they make a big difference. And a lot of learning is simply not clear to the people who are learning. And it's our job to make it clearer in terms of what we're trying to do and why. Um, so... One of the ways to do this is to take control of your professional development. And one way to take control of your professional development is to routinely build in opportunities to experiment with new techniques and to routinely gather evidence. I hope I've made that clear. And to do it in a systematic way adds value to the process. Now, Two things I'm going to post on the um, Google Drive are how you might use coaching questions to enhance your professional dialogue and learning. And I've separated the professional learning conversation into two parts, before the lesson and after the lesson. And there's a structure to the way, you, the way you have your professional conversation. Now, 
please do not think that this is the only way to do it. This is not the only way to do it. It is a way that I have tried which works. So if you are working <clears throat> with a colleague, and I hope you are, then before, before your hopefully it will involve observing them it, trying out the new technique in their lesson. In order to be clear about what you are doing, here is a, a thinking frame. I call this a thinking frame, which you might use when you're working with a colleague before the lesson that you're going to collaborate on, okay? Okay, so far? So before the lesson, you use the GROW model. The GROW stands for G-R-O-W. Goal, reality, options, what have you decided to do? This is the process that you want the teacher that you're working with to go through. And your job, when you are ob observing them, is to support them in the process. That's your job. When they are observing you, it becomes their job. But when you're observing them, you are effectively a peer coach, okay? And here are some of the questions that you can ask. Come on. Oh, that's too quick, sorry. Can you see that? So when you're in the pre-lesson conversation, thank you, Khalid. When you're in the pre-conversation, you're asking them what they hope to achieve and why. And then you step them into the reality. So they'll tell you, you ask them about their goal, and then you step them through to the reality. This is about listening, the reality. Allow the teacher to talk through their lesson plan. It should be based on a plan with clear objectives, clear outcomes, and clear success criteria. The purpose of this part of the conversation is for you to ask the type of questions that help them to reflect on the choices they are about to make. This is a high quality professional conversation. This is not a chat. Once the person has had time to discuss that, to talk about that and reflect upon it, you move through to the options. In the options stage of the conversation, the pre-lesson conversation, you've already talked through the lesson plan. This is where you ask them what the different options are. So what might you do? Why? Why, why are you choosing to do this? What do you think the impact's going to be? You look at the options about what they could do. And then finally, you come to the what. Now, this might happen like this. You might cycle through these different four parts of the conversation several times before you arrive at the final what, okay? It doesn't just go A, B, C, D, or G, R, O, W. It goes G, R, G, O, R, O, G, O sometimes. But you end up at W. So what are you going to do? And at this point in the conversation, that's when you start to write things down on, on, um, on, the, uh, um, on, the, on the lesson observe the peer lesson observation thing. This is when you start to write things down here. Because you're saying, what are you going to do? 
and this is where you encourage the teacher to commit, to make some clear commitments to what they're going to do and what they want you in a practical way to look for in the lesson so that you can gather evidence on their behalf of the impact. That is the pre-lesson thinking, talking, coaching framework. Here are an example of questions for each part. Examples of the types of questions you might be asking. Now, you might be more comfortable doing this in Arabic, although many people who I've listened to, your English is fantastic. So this is an example of the type of questions you might ask. I'll let you read them. I'm not going to read them out. Remember, in this part of the conversation, you're helping them to be clear about what, they, what it is they're trying to do, their goal. Here's an example of questions from the reality part of the conversation. These are examples. It is not a list. Well, it is a list, but it's not the only questions that you might ask. When you move through to the part of the conversation about exploring options, here are examples of the types of questions that you might ask to get your colleague to think. And then finally, when you're coming to the decision, here are examples of the types of questions for the what. So you're beginning to get the idea that I work in a structured way. When I'm working on professional development, even down to the language. Then there is the actual evidence gathering when you are present in the lesson, you have established a focus, you have committed to trying something new, and your colleague is gonna help you now by being in your lesson and being your eyes and ears so they can gather evidence of whether it's working or not and any impact
and the person who is supporting you is making notes possibly using something like this to remind them what the focus is. Because during the conversation that you had before the lesson, that's the peer lesson observation sheet if you couldn't see it, um, you are, you've been very specific, so you've written it down. So you both know, you might photocopy it or you both write down the same thing. But that is in, in effect, you end up with a contract an agreement. So the first part is the uh, high quality professional dialogue to help support the teacher to think through what they're gonna do differently and why. The second part of the process is the actual lesson when you're in the lesson gathering evidence about the focus, not about all the other stuff just the things that are relevant to what the teacher decided to do. The third part of the process is the post-lesson professional dialogue, the conversation after the lesson. I call it the debrief session. And for this, I have an, another tool that I use and it's called Reef. So after the lesson, and you need to put time aside for this, you will not be able to benefit from deep professional learning without throwing a considerable amount of time and energy at it. Emotional energy as well as intellectual energy. It takes time, it takes commitment, it takes energy and some of that is emotional energy it costs there is a cost the greater the cost often the deeper the learning or the faster the learning the more you put in the more you get out In the post-lesson conversation, after the lesson, I have four phases for you to consider. I call it REEF. The R stands for recapping and refocusing. So what is it we were doing again? Okay, yes, I've got it here, right. So, and you just recap. This is what we set out to do. And then you evaluate, you evaluate the evidence. So this part of the conversation is so actually what happened actually, this is what we, this is what we set out to do. This is what we hoped would happen. And the, here's some evidence about what actually did happen. So both of you, but primarily the person who was supporting the teacher, the peer coach, present evidence. Now that might be pupils work, it might be a video recording of children working. It might be a video recording. It might be a recording of the teacher working. It might be a, a five minute, in, it might be a recording of talking to pupils. It might be things you wrote down. It could be anything. The evidence could be anything. But presumably, the more you do this, the better you get at gathering evidence and knowing what to look for. Once you've once you've got the evidence in front of you, you then explore what this evidence is telling you about what went well and what would be better. The WWW and the EBI, even better if. And you can explain and expand. Here is where the experiential learning cycle comes in. Because you explore, you generalize, you evaluate, and this then leads you to your next focus. The F is your future focus. And this is what it looks like. So this is a structured professional 
dialogue. This is not a cozy conversation. It doesn't mean to say you can't have a nice cup of coffee, but it's a, it's a structured professional dialogue, the aim of which is to support the teacher to reflect and to get more value out of the time, out of the experience. And here are some examples of questions. So for the recap, here are some examples. Oh, sorry. Let's just recap on what we're trying to do. What were you hoping to achieve? Why did you decide on that course of action? That's your recap and refocus. And then we go into the first of the E's, which is the evidence, evaluating the evidence. Those are example questions. The observant ones amongst you will notice that they are all open questions. There are no closed questions. Then you go through the experiential learning cycle where you're evaluating, you're, ex sorry, you're, you're extrapolating, you're generalizing, understanding, deepening your understanding. These are questions for that part of the conversation. There's one closed question in that list. But all the rest are open. And then final part of the professional dialogue after the lesson is to find the focus for the next peer coaching observation opportunity. So the last question here is, okay, so what are we doing next? And that's when you go back into, you fix a time, and you go back through the, into the GROW model. So what's your goal now? So the, the G fits onto the end of the F, goes F and G, just like the alphabet. That, I'm afraid, is our time is up. And I have only just scratched the surface of what I wanted to do. I'm so sorry. Um, I wanted to revisit with you all about learning objectives. However, I think it's pretty obvious from the slides without me having to talk it through with you. So today I focused on Number one and two. I will liaise with Aisha, who will take you through three, four, and five in your next session. I obviously spent a long time trying to, the first hour and a bit, trying to get feedback from you, <laughs> which was great. And I feel as if I know you a lot better now. 
Uh, so thank you a million times for sharing. That I really, really appreciate that. Um, but 